Now, uh, before we begin chapter 8, I want you to keep in mind an important concept that we covered uh, two weeks ago when we were in chapter 7. The author explained how Jesus' priestly ministry is far superior than that of Aaron's. Now, he did this by comparing the priestly ministries of of Jesus and Melchizedek. Now, this whole idea, this whole concept would have probably shocked many of his Jewish readers who were um, reading this letter originally. Um, And they would have been shocked because they probably never really considered that uh, a greater priestly ministry than that of Aaron's was even possible. And so now... The question uh, then becomes, should a superior priest minister in an old and inferior covenant? Well, the the author here of Hebrews will answer that question um, by explaining that as a superior priest, Jesus Christ has ushered in a superior covenant. And so we're also going to see here in this chapter how the old covenant and its earthly priests actually they anticipated. They looked forward to this new superior and far better covenant. And there are many things that we'll be covering today. In, this, in these 13 verses of chapter 8, uh, many things that we, you'll be able to apply to yourself and to your lives. So, um, so let's ask the Lord to speak to us this morning before we get into his word. And, um, and I'll be sharing with you what, what is going on here with these passages. Heavenly Father, we ask you this morning that you bless this morning's message that you will bless those that are here, that are watching in this live, or maybe watching it later, listening to it later on, that you will also speak to them powerfully, Lord. Lives will be changed. Marriages, relationships will be changed, Lord. And that you will just do a, a beautiful, wonderful miracle in, in every person's life that's watching. Fill this room with your spirit, Lord. Show us what it is that you want us to know now, Lord, and may may we take it with us for the rest of our lives. Thank you once again. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. I've broken this down into two sections, and uh, for now I'll be reading the first part, the first section. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1, and the Word of God says, Now the main point of what is being said is this. We have this kind of high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and the true tabernacle that was set up by the Lord and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it was necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he wouldn't be a priest, since there are those, since there are those offering these gifts prescribed by the law. These serve as a copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was warned when he was about to complete the tabernacle. For God said, be careful that you make everything according to the patterns that was shown to you on the mountain. But Jesus has now obtained a superior ministry, and to that degree he is the mediator of a better covenant which has been established on better promises. Now, throughout the Old Testament, we're told that 
God made a serious, a series of covenant, covenants with Adam, Noah, Abraham, and Moses. Now, to the original uh, Jewish readers, they would have known how important these covenants were to their religion and their identity as a people. But in the passage that we just read, the author is now telling everybody, now telling these readers and us as well, that every single covenant in Israel's history culminates with Christ, the guarantee of a superior covenant. But before he explains this new and greater covenant, he first has to point out the need for a greater priest. So he begins with, in verse 1, by telling us that the main point of his argument is this. In other words, just in case his readers aren't following him, haven't been following him in the first seven chapters, here he basically simplifies it all, all those chapters, with the words, we have this kind of high priest. See, for the last seven chapters, he's told us what we've needed. Well, now... He tells us we have exactly what we need. We need Jesus as a great high priest who mediates now a new and far better covenant. But now in those first two verses, the writer presents several summary arguments to prove that our Lord is indeed a superior high priest. He first proves Jesus' moral adequacy in verse 1 with the words, again, we have this kind of high priest, which refers to, back to what he said in Hebrews chapter 7, verses 22 to 28. Fact is, Jesus Christ is morally perfect and yet identified with us in our needs and temptations. And this makes him superior to any other priest, past or present. Those of his readers who wanted to go back into the Old Testament priesthood would have to leave this kind of high priest. Second, the writer then proves his finished, work also, his finished work also in verse 1. Today, today, right at this very moment, our Lord is seated because His work is completed. There were no chairs in the Old Testament tabernacle, no seats in the Old Testament tabernacle because the work of the priests was never finished. Each repeated sacrifice was only a reminder that none of the sacrifices ever provided a finished salvation. The blood of the animals didn't wash away sin or cleanse the guilty conscience. It only covered sin until that day when Jesus Christ died to take away the sins of the world. Third, He proves there in verse 1 as well, his enthronement. Jesus Christ isn't just seated. It's where he's seated that adds glory to his person and his work. He's seated on the throne in heaven at the right hand of the Father. His enthronement was a fulfillment of the Father's promise to the Son that was mentioned long ago, way before this, back in Psalm 110, verse 1. So not only did the high priest of Israel never sit down in the tabernacle, but he never sat down on the throne. Only a priest, after the order of Melchizedek, could be enthroned. For only Melchizedek, 
had, was both king and priest. And fourth, here, the writer proves in these first two verses, he proves Jesus' supreme exaltation. He, that is Jesus, is in the heavens. Jesus Christ, in his ascension and exaltation, passed through the heavens and is now exalted as high as anyone could be. In fact, the fact that he ministers in a heavenly sanctuary is important to the argument presented in this chapter. So using now these four summary arguments, I think that a reasonable conclusion can therefore be made. The presence of a superior high priest in heaven demands, it demands a superior covenant if he is to minister effectively to God's people. Now in verses 3 to 5, the writer details the priest's, the priest's duties in the tabernacle. And it gets really interesting. Now, some of this stuff I already mentioned uh, last time we were together and, or prior weeks, but let me just again briefly go over it because it's what's mentioned here in our passage. When the priest went into the tabernacle, he didn't go empty-handed. He took a sacrifice. He had to have something to offer. But Christ didn't fit that mold. He didn't fit that mold of a, of a typical Levitical priest. You see, the law stipulated that the high priest has, come through, has to come through the Aaronic, Aaronic um, line, through the tribe of Levi. But Jesus is from the tribe of Judah, not Levi. He is not an earthly priest from the line of Levi that brings his offering to an earthly tabernacle. He ministers, get this, he ministers in the heavenly tabernacle. And so this is what verses 4 and 5 is saying. He brings a superior offering. The priests on earth, the Levitical priests, serve as a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. Since the author wrote to Jewish Christians immersed in Greek culture, it's important to note the, the language of shadow, the language of shadow. His audience probably would have been familiar with Plato's parable of the cave. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with Plato, the philosopher, his um, parable of the cave. I thought it was interesting the first time I came across it. I shared it with my wife some years later, just recently, actually. Um, but this famous Greek philosopher that all these Greeks, whether they were Jew or not, would have known about. Well, this Plato, he argued that our knowledge is like that of a man who is kept in a fire-lit cave and only sees shadows of real objects when he looks at the cave's walls. And so thus, Plato believed that we only know things as shadows of the original. The real object cast the shadow. The real object is, 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 the, is the real thing that casts the shadow. Well, the Old Testament never presents the tabernacle as a shadow of something more real. The New Testament, however, emphasizes its shadowy nature. Repeatedly, the author of Hebrews shows us how to read the Old Testament. In this instance, he is showing us how to understand the Old Testament tabernacle. Like the Levitical priesthood, the tabernacle of old was inadequate. It displayed dimly very dimly, as great as it was and as glorious as, as it was, it displayed dimly the glory of God while also pointing 
to something greater. Now the second half of verse 5 notes that a careful reading of Exodus reveals a pattern for building the tabernacle. This pattern helps us to see that the earthly tabernacle was modeled after something else, namely the heavenly tabernacle. There in Exodus, God commanded the building of a tabernacle in which he would dwell among his people. And so Moses did that. He built a tabernacle in exactly the way God showed him. Now, by using the language of shadows and copies, the author of Hebrews shows us that these detailed plans and specifications were actually meant to reflect deeper realities. The plans laid out in Exodus chapter 26 were like plans for a replica of the real thing, which again is the heavenly temple. As such, the earthly tabernacle was like a shadow dancing on the wall of a cave. But we have a great high priest who doesn't offer sacrifices in a shadow. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, ministers in the true tent that the Lord set up. The heavenly temple is his sanctuary. In the book of Revelation, where the heavenly scene is described, we can find parallels of the Old Testament tabernacles. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 19, John makes it clear that there is a temple of God in heaven. But here's the thing, Revelation chapter 21, I believe, verse 22, also states that uh, there will be no temple in the eternal state. Why? Why is that? Because the entire city of God will be a temple. For example, Revelation chapter 6, it says that there's a brazen altar there. And in Revelation chapter 8, there's an altar of incense as well. The sea of glass in Revelation chapter 6 or chapter 4 reminds us of the labor. And, in, and the seven lamps of fire mentioned in Revelation chapter 4 suggests the seven branch lampstand of the tabernacle. And so, since Jesus is ministering in the original sanctuary and not the copy, he is ministering in a better place. So, what he's making these people think about, these original readers, and maybe some of us as well who are tempted to go back to our, you know, religions that we grew up in, and our religious acts and religious places. Um, but here, again, he tells them, these readers, why fellowship with priests who are serving in a copied sanctuary when you can fellowship with Christ? in the original heavenly sanctuary. It would be like trying to live on a blueprint instead of the actual building itself. Well, so far, the writer has showed us how Jesus is, uh, showed us that Jesus is the superior priest and that he's ministering now in a superior place heaven itself. In the next section that we're about to read, he's going to show us that Christ's work allows us now to directly and confidently enjoy God's presence. We no longer have to come before God in a tabernacle made by human hands. This great truth permeates. It permeates throughout the pages of the Old Testament. And so, again, this next passage that we're about to read will show us the king, the capital K, the king, who, rans who ransoms his people from their iniquities 
and brings them to peace with God, well, he's ushered in a new covenant by his blood. And that covenant is far greater in excellence, far greater in everything than the first. So let's read that second passage now together. Uh, You can read along while I read it out loud. And there in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 7, it says, For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion for a second one. But finding fault with his people, he says, See, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their ancestors on the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. I showed no concern for them, says the Lord, because they did not continue in my covenant. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And each person will not teach his fellow citizen and each and each his brother or sister saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least to the greatest of them. For I will forgive their wrongdoing and I will never again remember their sins. By saying a new covenant, he has declared that the first is obsolete. And what is obsolete and growing old is about to pass away. If you think about it, it must have been impressive. It must have been an impressive sight to see the high priests of the Bible, of whether it's the the New Testament or the Old Testament, to see the high, those high priests in, this, in their splendor of their priestly garments and uh, through their elaborate rituals at the tabernacles, at the tabernacle. The worshipers there would have had a few minutes of suspense every year when that priest, that high priest, disappeared behind the veil Their imagination must have run wild as they wondered, what is it like in there? What's he seeing? What's he doing? Will he come out alive? Then after a bit, after he would then come out, they would probably breathe easier and say, oh yeah, he made it. But always in the back of their minds, I'm sure they were always wondering, what is it like inside on the other side of that veil? There in the Holy of Holies, here what the author is basically saying in this passage is this. There was nothing compared to where Jesus is at the right hand of the throne of the majesty of heavens, in the heavens. Their yearly ritual was nothing compared to our high priest offering himself once for all on the cross and now serving in heaven in our behalf, on our behalf. His heavenly ministry is much more excellent than their entire earthly ministry ever was. And so the implied appeal is, don't even consider returning to the old earthly system that was a mere shadow Stay focused on Jesus, who is the reality and fulfillment of all that the old system pointed toward. Now, I want to share with you two applications before we look more deeply into it. First of all, Jesus serves in heaven on our behalf. Let him serve you. He serves in heaven on your behalf, so let him serve you. Our tendency is to focus on how we should serve Jesus. And there's certainly a a place for that. But there's also a place for just pausing, 
for just stopping from your busy activities, from everything that you're doing, all the ministering that you're doing, and allowing Jesus to serve you. For those of you involved in ministry or have been involved in ministry, those of you watching who are, who are serving in your churches, have you ever just stopped serving for a moment and allowed Jesus to serve you? That's his role now in heaven. To serve you. Do you remember Peter's horrified response when Jesus took the towel and basin and to wash the disciples' feet? What did, Jesus, what did Peter say? He said, never, never shall you wash my feet. But Jesus countered with, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. We have to allow the Lord, through the water of his word, to wash off that dirt that we pick up from walking in the world. It gives me chills thinking about it. Is that something you've considered? Spend every day of the week, pretty much, out there in the world. None of us are perfect. We all make mistakes. We all mess up. But do you spend time allowing him to wash you, to cleanse you, to serve you when you're feeling down, when you're feeling empty, when you're feeling not good about yourself? Sometimes, again, as I mentioned, it, we're so busy wanting to serve others that we forget that the Lord wants to serve you as well. So allow Him to do that. Allow Him to wash you. Don't be like Peter who says, Hey, don't, you, not, you don't have to do that for me. Don't do that for me. I don't want you to. No, He wants to. So allow Him to. Allow Him to serve you. As our high priest, he ministers on our behalf before the throne of the majesty. Take the time before him to allow his ministry to cleanse your soul. And the second application is this. The heavenly and spiritual is more real than the earthly and visible. Keep seeking the things above the author is making the point that the earthly tabernacle was not the real thing. The real tabernacle is in heaven, where Jesus now stands on our behalf. Again, we're prone to think that the, earth, that the earthly is real, but the heavenly is less real than what we can experience, than what we can experience with our senses. In other words, because this earth is tangible, because it's what we can see, hear, touch, taste, smell, it's real. And because heaven is, isn't, we, we can't do any of that stuff because it's in heaven. And we're not there in heaven. We just think, oh, it's imagined. Sometimes we're prone to think it's, it's not real, you know, or we just don't think about it that, that often. Because again, we, don't, we haven't experienced it with our senses. But listen to what Paul said in Colossians chapter 3, verse, verses 1 and 2. Paul said, keep seeking the things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. At the very least, this means that we should meditate so often on the things of God that they become more real to us than the things on earth. We can only apprehend the things of God by faith in the truths of His Word. Meanwhile, we're surrounded and, by, and bombarded by all the things we see on earth. 
So unless we're deliberately and consistently, and we consistently cultivate this heavenly vision, our priorities will get out of whack. It will get totally misaligned. We will get caught up pursuing the transitory and missing the eternal. Or in other words, we'll get so caught up with the here and now, what's happening now, what we can see ahead, what's coming and going, and miss out on what really matters. What's really important? The eternal. Like the rich man Jesus spoke of, we will build more storage units to hold all of our earthly goods, but we will be poor in relation to God. So remember, my friends, remember, my brothers and sisters in Christ, the earthly is the shadow. The heavenly is the real. Since Jesus is the better priest who ministers in the true tabernacle, he also is the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. The better promises of this better covenant are those of the new covenant that Jeremiah prophesied about in chapter 8, verses 8 through 12. Chapter 8, verses 8 through 12. Now, before I, I get into this section here, I want you to understand that many books and entire theological systems are, have been based on the interpretation and application of these verses. I don't have the time to get into all of them. So for now, I'll only mention three of them. First, we see in verse 7 that the better covenant wouldn't have been needed if the first covenant had been faultless. As I mentioned back in our study in, uh, back in chapter 7, the idea of the law of Moses being defective in any way would have been unthinkable for the Jews. See, the law was the foundation of their entire life. It was their basis. It was their uh, it was the basis of their religious worship. In chapter 7, the author argued that the change of the priesthood required a change of the law also, since the two were inextric inextricably bound together. Again, he used Psalm chapter 110, verse 4, to show, 110, verse 4, to show that David had predicted the change of the priesthood. And so here also he cites Jeremiah chapter 31 to show that the Old Testament itself also predicted a new covenant that would replace the old Mosaic covenant. The reason for replacing the old covenant was that it was defective. Plain and simple, it was defective. He was quick to add that the problem was not the law itself. It wasn't the law. It was the people who failed to keep it. And he writes in, verse, in chapter 8, in verse 8 here, for finding fault with them. Paul said the same thing in, in Romans chapter 7, verse 12. The law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. But he goes on to say in Romans chapter 8, verse 3, for, that, for, what law, for what the law could not do, weak as it was, weak, weak as it was through the flesh. See, my point being that sinners were unable to keep God's holy law. It didn't supply the change of heart. Or, enabling, or the enabling spirit, or the enabling ministry of the Holy Spirit that would help us to obey it. 
Obey Him. As Paul explained in Galatians chapter 3, the purpose of the law was not to impart spiritual life, but rather to reveal our sin so that we would be driven to faith in Christ as our only remedy. Second, in verses 8 through 12, there it shows us, he shows us, the writer shows us that since God found fault with the people, he promised a new covenant. This covenant would be made with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. As some churches, some people argue that the church is the new Israel. And since Jesus said that the communion cup is the new covenant in his blood, the church has replaced Israel as the recipient of this new covenant. But listen carefully. Romans chapter 11, verses 17 through 21, says that the branches of unbelieving Israel were broken off so that, the, so that we, us Gentiles, might be grafted in. Thus, we who believe share in God's new covenant promises to Israel. But as Paul goes on to say in Romans chapter 11, after the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, all of Israel will be saved. And then he refers to Jeremiah 31. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. It's also important to recognize that while these new covenant blessings have been inaugurated by Jesus, their complete fulfillment awaits his second coming. While the New Testament is clear on the fact that the new covenant has now been, again, um, inaugurated, that is, the blessings belonging to the new covenant are now being dispensed to all those who believe in Jesus, whether Jew or Gentile. It's equally clear that the new covenant promises are not yet fully realized. The promises of Jeremiah, Isaiah, and Ezekiel describe a people who have the new law written in their, in their hearts, who walk in the way of the Lord, fully under control of the Holy Spirit. These same promises look to a people who are raised from the dead, enjoying the blessings of an eternal inheritance with God, dwelling with them, and in them forever. Only, ladies and gentlemen, only in the future will those blessings be granted in full. And the complete transformation promised by the new, Kevin, the new covenant will be realized. That future will arrive when Jesus returns to earth. Now again, I can only just briefly skim through the features of this new covenant here, of this new covenant right here, right now. But let me again mention just a few features of this new covenant. The new covenant will be distinctly different than the old covenant that Israel didn't keep. The emphasis here is on this continuity, not on continuity. God says, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers. This here is a major problem for, for many, those who uh, uh, believe in covenant theology, which views the Old and the New Testament as two different administrations of the same covenant grace. The emphasis in that view is on the unity and continuity of the covenant throughout history, whereas the emphasis here is clearly on this continuity. Another feature, the new covenant will involve God putting his laws into the minds and hearts of his people. In Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 4, just prior to his death, Moses told the Israelites, 
Yet to this day, the Lord has not given you a heart to know, nor eyes to see, nor ears to hear. They had the law written in tablets of stone, but they lacked the heart to obey. But in Ezekiel chapter 36, which parallels the new covenant promises in Jeremiah, God promises, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. In Romans chapter 6 verse 17, Paul rejoices that through that Though you were slaves to sin, you became obedient from the heart that, uh, to, from the heart to, f- to that form of teaching to which you were committed. The new covenant blessings changes our hard hearts. Another feature: the new covenant will involve a close relationship between God and His people. We see that in verse ten, the second part of verse ten. Here. I will be their God and these shall be my people. This isn't really anything new. And that God promised this to Israel in Exodus, in, at the Exodus. But as one commentator put it, the God who saves people in Christ is a God who redeemed in a new and definitive, definitive way. And when people have been saved At the awful cost of Calvary, they are the people of God in a way never known before. The new covenant will mean that every person will know the Lord. The point isn't that there will be no place for teachers, but rather that the knowledge of God will not be confined to just a privileged few. All those in the new covenant will have their own intimate, personal knowledge of God. The new covenant will bring complete forgiveness of sins. The sacrifices of the old covenant couldn't completely remove sins. They were a shadow of the good things, as I previously mentioned, of the good things that were to come in Christ, who by who by the one sacrifice of himself completely paid the debt of our sins. And thus, the better covenant wouldn't have been needed if the first covenant had been faultless. And so, since God found fault with the people, he promised a new covenant. So then, what we see in verse 13, in the final verse of this chapter, is that from... The time that God promised a new covenant, the old became obsolete. And it was about to disappear. Jeremiah's prophecy, which was written about uh, 600 B.C., uh, there he stated the countdown time that the, when the old covenant would disappear. In A.D. 70, when Titus destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, and the temple. Israel ceased to exist as a nation and the sacrifices which were at the heart of the old covenant system, they ceased to be offered. In light of the argument of Hebrews, of, of Hebrews, I'm not sure I can accept the view that literal sacrifices will again be offered in the millennium. Now there's There's argument on both ends, that there will be, that there won't be. At this point, it doesn't really matter. We won't really know until we're there, until we get there. But again, the argument here is that the perfect has come in Christ. Why go back to the old and obsolete? And so with all that has been mentioned here in this chapter, with everything that's been said, everything that we read and everything that I shared with you, and and I want you to ask yourself, is Jesus Christ seated at the right hand of the majesty on high, the mediator of the new covenant, 
the consume is is he the consuming focus of your Christian life? If Jesus, your Lord and Savior, the person who forgave you of your sins, the person who died for you, if he's now seated at the right hand of God, is he the consuming focus of your Christian life? Do you daily seek to know him, to love him, and glorify him because he gave himself on the cross for you? See, while Christianity requires obedience, it's not the external obedience of rules and rituals, but the obedience from the heart out of love for God. Let me read to you again what it says in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, what it says there. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For if you, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God, when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. Are you holding on to that? Are you holding on to those promises? I am. Again, I know that I'm not perfect. My wife will tell you that I'm not perfect. I make a lot of mistakes. We all make a lot of mistakes. But this is what the new covenant does. That's what he's brought in, this new covenant, that we can now easily ask for forgiveness right away. We don't have to wait once a year for that priest to go in with the animal or offer that blood sacrifice and go into the Holy of Holies. No, we can go straight to the tabernacle ourselves and ask for forgiveness. We have now in Christ, because of him, a better, more superior covenant. Covenant of grace, mercy, peace. If that's what you're seeking, that's what you're looking for, I want to invite you to the cross. I want to invite you there where Jesus died for you to forgive you of your sins so that you may be cleansed and you may now have a right relationship with God. Many of you are are probably lost, confused, broken, you're not sure about how you can, you have the, basically you have this big hole in your heart and you've tried many things, many ways to fill that hole and none, nothing, nothing at all has been able to fill it. Well, now I want you to, I, I want to ask you now to allow Jesus to fill that, that hole in your heart. And he will. Trust me, he will. He will forgive you. He will make you. He will pour his spirit, God's spirit, into your heart. And you will be a new born again person. He offers you so many promises. But the biggest, biggest promise that you'll have eternal life. So if you're ready to, to do that, if you're ready to make Jesus your Lord and Savior, if I want you to close your eyes and bow your head and, and pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe that you died for my sins and raised and, and rose from the dead. I now turn from my sins and confess you as my Lord and Savior. 
Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. And I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. If you pray that, please reach out to us. We want to know about it. We want to help you in your next steps of your Christian walk. Maybe help you find a church, and you know, if you need a Bible, we can send one out to you. But um, congratulations. You're now a member. You're now part of God's family, and you're a child of God, and you're my brother and sister in Christ, and I want to hear all about it. So uh, there's several ways you can reach out to us, whether it's on our social media pages, our website. Um, um, but don't hesitate to, to let us know how we can continue to minister to you. Keep in mind, don't forget, the Lord is there. He's, we have a better covenant now. He cares for you. He loves you and wants to have a relationship with you. Thank you for watching. Till next week, we love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.